and it's a pleasure and honor for me to introduce composer Svi Avni, third on the upper line. Professor Avni is the oldest Israeli composer today. I'm happy to tell you that he is 96 years old and is still composing. I just finished an article on three of his compositions, which were written after the, my monograph on mm -hmm. him was finished. So Tzvi, maybe you'll open and say something about the sonata homage, a block which we will hear in a minute. Uh, I composed it, uh, I don't uh, remember exactly the time, the, the year, but it was uh, a, a kind of uh, a remembrance and celebration of Bloch at the Hebrew University in, by, by, in Jerusalem. And um, the Bloch Society in Israel was headed by, at that time by Dalia Atlas, Professor Dalia Atlas. Mm -hmm. And uh, she asked me whether I could compose something suitable to that uh, event. And uh, I decided to compose a, a piece, uh, actually a two movement sonata, not long one, uh, for cello and piano. And I had the feeling in some way I am um, relating really to motives that uh, had a kind of impact on me, Hello. which, which had uh, uh, to me the kind of uh, nature of uh, a bit close to Bloch. I think Bloch, uh, in, in spite of the fact he, that he never he visited Israel and uh, he didn't, uh, I don't think there was any connection. You asked maybe knowing much better than I about that. Um, but uh, I think that many of us, uh, even Ben Chaim, have had some kind of uh, um, inner feeling which is close to the, which is, uh, which is by, 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 by Bloch a kind of a bit of influence, or at least close to it unconsciously. And, and, and uh, that's when I look now at this sonata, which uh, I hardly heard once. At the, anyway, I, I this morning I looked at the sonata, and I really find there are some close relations, a kind of uh, inner feeling of what we call Jewish motives. Um, to define it, it is very, uh, you know, manifold. Some have other elements to, to emphasize. I feel that the, the, the minor third and the minor second and the frame of either fourth and fifth, open fourth and fifth, are typical, I think, to what we call, what, what we call in, in the, or what we find in the, in the elements which we consider as Jewish music. Maybe we, uh, it's, it's hard to define for us what is Jewish music. The, do, the Goyim know it better. They know what to say, what is Jewish. And they, they used to say about Malo that he has some Jewish elements. And of course, Mendelssohn, which we really also agree, I think. So I, I feel that there is something, the, the, especially of course, in. The, in the melodic elements, in the melodic ways of using the, the melodic lines. And I understand Yoash has a recording, which I don't uh, have yet. So uh, if he, he is going to play something from it, I'll be happy to, to listen to. Yeah. Okay, so I'll open my lecture now. Um, my point of departure is the Sonata Homage à Bloch by Tzvi Avni, composed in 1908. Still quite unknown, I have initiated the first video recording of this fine work, 
played by cellist Yoni Etzioni and pianist Tal Samnod. We will now listen to the first movement of this two movement sonata. Please think of Bloch Jewish works while listening.
you have surely noticed not only the typical block patterns, such as the repeated augmented seconds and the offbeat cadences, as well as the very long melodic lines spreading over large ranges. The fact that Avni could create such a convincing sequel to Bloch's Jewish works expands our understanding of Bloch's complex personality. We should assign much importance to Bloch's much quoted letter to the organizers of the unfortunate World Center for Jewish Music of 1937. Quote, I have but hearkened to an inner voice, an instinct rather than any cold and dry reasoning process, a voice which surged up in me on reading certain passages in the Bible, Job, Ecclesiastes, the Psalms, the Prophets, unquote. And now the most significant question, to what extent such music is Jewish? To what extent it is just Ernest Bloch? I know nothing. The future alone will decide. Now is the future and we may decide. A year later, only the international activity of the World Center was suffocated by the war. A few quotes from the Bloch Studies volume would enrich our discussion. Clara Moritz has written that quote, for Bloch, alienation was not only an acquired cause of a great man. Having been born into a Jewish family in Switzerland and nurtured on French and German cultures, then spending most of his adult life in the United States, he was home nowhere. Clara Moritz has noted that uh, Bloch often quoted the BC's remark, on a peu, we are few. David Kushnir has quoted conductor Walter Demros, president of the Academy of Arts and Letters, writing when Bloch was awarded the Gold Medal of the Academy in 1942. Quote, his music is highly idealistic and individual in character and brilliant in development. He is not influenced by any other composer or controlled by any school. Always is it Ernest Bloch who speaks from the pages of his score, unquote. Nowhere is the word Jewish mentioned anywhere, and that in a formal festive statement. Writing of Bloch, Bloch second string quartet, composed in 1945, critic Olin Downs, wrote after the 1947 festival in New York, quote, it bears all the earmarks of a late work of a highly musical, ever developing intelligence, unquote. And Robert Sabin wrote on the same occasion that it must have been heartening to hear the music of so humane and independent a spirit and to see honor brought to an 
artist who has never tried to be fashionable or popular, but simply to produce the best possible work, unquote. Again, not a word about Jewishness. Yet Kushnir commented in the 1916 Bloch Studies volume that the quartet was devoid of and of the exotic flavoring of the early Jewish world, unquote. Indeed, Bloch's second string, string quartet hovers in the abstract heights of Beethoven and Bartok's quartets. Let's hear now. Loch gradually became so identified with Jewishness that he himself felt a need to dissociate a given work from Jewishness and moreover to combine Jewishness with exoticism. I happened to discuss Bloch some time ago with great Vivaldi scholar Michael Talbot, who dislikes Bloch's music, which identified with Jewish exoticism. That it, he must have been unfamiliar with Bloch's non-Jewish work. The most significant distinction about Bloch's music has been made by Alex Knapp. 
בלוך, קווט, בלוך הסיס טו בי א ג'ויש קומפוזר, and has now become a composer of Jewish music. I would suggest that Bloch's works should be classified not as Jewish or non-Jewish, but in well-defined separate groups. The first group is that of the epic local work. The first is America of 1916, followed by Israel, started in the same year, and then Helvetia, 1926 to 1931. America is a 20 minutes long symphonic poem moving in slow, mostly piano, extremely tense, gestures, creating associations of huge expanses. Link. Israel, completed in 1924 and related in time to the Jewish cycle, is also an epic symphonic poem. It is much colored by Jewish patterns and vocal phrases in Hebrew. I will not play Israel because I decided that none of my examples will be Jewish. It is much uh, 
The third large scale epic work is Helvisha. Completed in 1931, it develops along the same expensive lines as America and opens with mysterious horn calls. The three locally defined works represent Bloch's urge at belonging somewhere. The epic works include not only geographical images, the enormous piano quintet number one, written in 1923, is also an epic work such as its exciting opening gesture. Thank you. 
what a wonderful piece. Um, the 40 minutes long monumental concerto symphonique for two pianos and a big orchestra composed in 1950 is also an epic work, yet much more dramatic. Too long to illustrate now with a huge mass of sound, each of its three movements, huge movements move, move with no rest in constant high tension. It comprises a unique great work. It is too rarely performed and it has nothing Jewish about it. In another group of works, Bloch joined the neoclassical composers, mostly French, such as his 1951 concertino, the first movement of which is written in a systematic imitative technique, including a statement in universal. We will hear now the first movement played by Olesandr Der Svet Viola, Sofia Matvienko flute, and Stanislav Guminiuk piano. To conclude, another well-defined group is that of the small romantic 
character pieces, such as the three minutes mysterious humoresque macabre, the first of the four episodes written in 1924, here played by Dahlia Atlas and the Atlas Camerata Orchestra. The group I reach last, but will not illustrate, is the one that defined Bloch's more successfully than all others, that of the Jewish music. Flautist story templates of the Philharmonic Israel, Israeli Philharmonic, the great, say the great Alfred Einstein, who say that Bloch tried to build the spirit of the people out of himself. When I studied at the Academy of Music in Tel Aviv in the 1950s, Bloch was identified exclusively with the concept of Jewish music. Although the repertory of the Ramat Gan Chamber Orchestra, of which I was a member, regularly included also the Concerto Grosso number one. When Bloch died in 1959, Teplitz wrote, in Israel, Bloch did not manage to serve as an artistic example. He remains somehow a stranger to us as an artistic example. 
one can only be sorry that Bloch never visited us. The last point was especially sensitive. Bloch and Mio were honorary chairman of the World Center for Jewish Music. After the war, Mio, though confined to a wheelchair, did visit Israel. Bloch did, did not. A qualitative judgment of the groups just discussed would lead to the following three general conclusions. One, Bloch's high self-judgment as a genius led him to put the utmost inspiration in certain of his unique compositions, such as the string quartet number two and the concerto symphonique, and he did not want a popular Jewish group to compete with them, and indeed they did not. Bloch wished to belong to the monumental landscape of America and Helvetia through the popular genre of the symphonic poem. Likewise, he wished to belong to the concept of Israel, yet through the spiritual Jewish symbols rather than that, those of the landscape. Bloch also wished to belong to the historical genre of the classical form and to the expressive, powerful, romantic world. Finally, each group led him to a separate, independent decision, and the Jewish group was by no means superior to the others. Still, it fared much better. A historical visit in young Israel would have placed him on a high Jewish pedestal, and this went too far from him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Hirschberg. Very uh, fascinating, stimulating uh, presentation. And I'm sure that we have uh, comments or questions or both for Jehoash. Maybe you can, ah, Agnes Cora, you have your hand up. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, so thank you so very much because it was so informative as well as very enjoyable to listen to this talk. But I'm going to complain now because I would love to hear a little bit more um, about Sri Avni, who is sitting there, which is an amazing privilege for me, even just, just to look at his face on the Zoom. And yeah, so this is what I'm missing from this session. And please forgive me. <laughs> well, you will, because in about one or two months at the most, there will be a new issue of Minad, the journal of the Israeli Musicological Society, which is published in English now. And there I will have a whole article on Sri Avni and his three recent compositions written after I published my monograph on him. Okay. I have a question, may I? Yes, please ask. Uh, Josh, <coughs> can you uh, speak a bit about uh, Bloch's consciousness of his American influences. I found in both orchestral pieces something quite close to um, uh, 
uh, the Fifth Symphony of Dvořák. Yes, the second movement is so melodic and the instrumentation. Somehow it reminded me of that music. Was he conscious of that or what he, was he actually even uh, speaking about the, the influence of American life on him? Uh, influence of American life, I don't know. Well, he lived in America for most of the time, more than any other country. And uh, naturally it influenced him. His beloved act activity was to walk early in the morning on the seashore in Oregon and to collect stones. He was very much related to America, which is the country which really recognized him, gave him most of every more than everything, more than Switzerland, and definitely more than Germany. Yeah. But uh, he was he felt very much American. That's true. He also directed a conservatory in Cleveland, which he opened. So he was very much part of America. But in his uh, uh, avoiding of a visit to Israel and uh, of uh, any kind of relations, I think he, he didn't have here. Uh, was it a kind of uh, bad feeling on his side, or was he somehow uh, uh, somehow angry about something? Maybe he was not uh, satisfied with things that he expected. No, I don't think so. Teplis was very disappointed that Bloch did not respond to the wonderful attitude he received from the establishment in Israel. Actually, in fact, there were only two years, I mean, 10 years, which he lived parallel to the state of Israel. He died in 1959, 10, Israel after, 10 years after Israel was founded. But people very much wanted him to come. And I think he, was, he had something against it. He did not want to come to Israel. Uh -huh. And my point is that he wanted to define his music by groups of words. And the Jewish group was by no means superior to the neoclassical or to the uh, geographical group. For each group, he had certain language, certain vocabulary, which he employed then. None was more important. And the greatest works were really the second string quartet or the concerto symphonique. None of the Jewish groups like Shlomo was as great as the second string quartet. So his effort was directed toward the non-Jewish works. It's hard for us to think about Bloch in this way. But I think Bloch himself said that is it Jewish or Bloch? And I think it's Bloch. I also wonder if, he, I know in those last 10 years, he was getting ill, he was getting old, he had a cancer, he had colon cancer um, at one point within there. I wonder if that might have also had something to do with him. He didn't travel much anywhere in those last 10 years. That's definite, because I cannot really tell whether he thought about going to Israel or didn't even think of it, because he, had he decided to come, he would have received all kinds of help you know, by way of uh, then flying then naturally was much more long and difficult than today. And maybe he was really sick, but to come just for one week 
for five days for a certain event, I think was not so difficult. He would, could have come. You know, of course, much more than me what he felt at that time. I will, I'll try to do some more research because I haven't really delved deeply into it, but it's very interesting to, to see if there was any kind of communication with anybody about that. 